Hello, everybody, and welcome to Care Talk. My name is Laura Packard, and I'm the founder of Healthcare Voices, but also healthcare is personal for me because I'm a cancer survivor, and I've gone through everything from surprise medical bills to insurance denials uh, and much more. So we are here, the experts, to answer your healthcare and health insurance questions and get you the information you need for your own healthcare, as well as we have special guests that talk about larger issues in our healthcare system. So today I'm pleased to welcome Diane Archer from Just Care uh, to talk about uh, open enrollment for Medicare Advantage, which is running now through March 31st. So if you're signed up for health insurance through Medicare Advantage, what can or should you be doing right now during the open enrollment period? Okay, great question. So Medicare Advantage is not monolithic. Medicare Advantage is a series of different health plans, several hundred across the country, I believe. And each one offers a different set of benefits uh, that um, are on top of the Medicare benefits that these plans are supposed to also cover. And then they have different costs associated with those benefits. So it sounds pretty straightforward, but what we're seeing repeatedly uh, through different research is that even though a lot of these plans are perhaps offering people the Medicare benefits that they would otherwise have in traditional Medicare, there is widespread and persistent inappropriate delays and denials of care and coverage by many of the Medicare Advantage plans. And that has been found now twice by the Office of the Inspector General at the Department of Health and Human Services. So it's a serious concern. Uh, but what we don't know is which plans are delaying and denying care more than others, which are the bad actors. And then another report just came out by the Kaiser Family Foundation showing that um, in 2021, the Medicare Advantage plans overall denied 2 million requests for prior authorization. So, you know, this is not good for people who need care. And if you don't need care and you're in Medicare Advantage, well, maybe what you have is all you need and you'll be lucky and you won't need to worry about not getting services when you need them. But if you do need care, I think the thing that you must be thinking about in Medicare Advantage is, are you going to be able to see the doctors that you need to see? Are the specialists that you want to see in their network? What is the maximum that you're going to have to pay out of pocket for the in-network services that you need. Um, and that can vary from as high as $8,300 a year in out-of-pocket costs just for the in-network care that's covered by Medicare um, to you know much, much lower, depending again on the plan you pick. What are your premiums? Uh, what are your upfront costs, your deductibles? That's basically all you can know. And then you should compare that, though, to traditional Medicare's costs, because you can switch, as you mentioned, until March 31st to traditional Medicare. With traditional Medicare, uh, you will uh, pay nothing additional for that, that coverage, the Part A and Part B inpatient, outpatient coverage. But you will have to buy supplemental coverage unless you have Medicaid or your former employer offers it to you. And that coverage can easily cost $2,500 a year. But with that coverage, that $2,500, you know that the care that you need, the care your doctor wants you to get, that you agree that you want, um, is all covered wherever you are in the U.S. And that's really something that alleviates the stress of um, being being unhealthy, knowing that at least you can get your care without worrying about the financial uh, implications of getting the care. And with Medicare Advantage, I think it's fair to say, because there is no supplemental coverage that will pick up your out-of-pocket costs, people are constantly being forced to choose between their health care and their rent or their heat or some other basic necessity, because the out-of-pocket costs can be so enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Open enrollment for Medicare Advantage is running through March 31st. Open enrollment for health insurance through the Affordable Care Act is uh, over, however, in um, all the states for this year, 2023. But 
you can still sign up for health insurance if you qualify for a special enrollment period. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. So maybe you lost your insurance coverage. Uh, you lost your job. Maybe you got married or divorced. Uh, you had a baby. You moved. Um, any of those things could qualify you still to sign up for health insurance through the Affordable Care Act this year. And some groups are eligible for a special enrollment period year round, like if you're a member of a federally recognized tribe, or in most states, if your income is projected to be under 150% of the federal poverty level this year, which is about $20,000 a year if you uh, file solo. Uh, if you're not eligible for the special enrollment period, it's still worth applying uh, for Medicaid uh, to see if you're eligible. So you should go to healthcare.gov, um, find out what you're eligible for, and open enrollment for everyone uh, comes back on November 1st. Our next question is from Frank, who says, what if I need Medicare Part C and can't afford it? Diane? So Medicare Part C is another name for Medicare Advantage. And just to be very clear here, everybody with Medicare has Part A, which is inpatient coverage, and Part B, which is outpatient medical coverage, coverage for your doctor services, your physical therapy, that kind of thing. And then people who opt out of traditional Medicare and into Medicare Advantage have Medicare Part C. And Medicare Advantage plans come with zero premiums in many instances. So affordability is really um, not an issue if you're healthy because you're not paying for Medicare uh, Part C on top of your Medicare and Me Medicare Part B premiums. Um, and you might have a deductible, but again, often with Medicare, advantage. There's no premium, there's no deductible, but you do have high out-of-pocket costs when you need costly care. I want here now to distinguish between Medicare Part C, again, Medicare Advantage, and the different alphabet soup of supplemental coverage that's available under traditional Medicare. Uh, when you have traditional Medicare, you generally want a supplemental plan either through Medicaid or through a former employer or a plan that you buy in the individual market. And the ones in the individual market are labeled um, A through, I think it's now N. Each one is different, but they're all standardized. And a lot of people used to buy C because it was fairly compre comprehensive. It's now been replaced by D. Uh, but the point is uh, that that the Medicare supplemental coverage options are this alphabet soup, but they're they're uh, they're part uh, they're they're not part C, they're Plan C or Plan D or Plan E or Plan F, and so those can be expensive. But it's worth um, looking at a high deductible plan um, for your supplemental coverage, which will cost less, and you'll only need to use it, for example, when you need healthcare services. Um, as one way to lower your costs for supplemental coverage if you are opting for traditional Medicare. Okay. And our next question is from Eric, who wants to know, why aren't biologic drugs covered by manufacturers for Medicare patients? Um, I'm retired and I lost biologic benefits. Uh, Diane? That's also an excellent question. Okay. So here we go. Under the anti-kickback laws, people with Medicare are not allowed to get their drugs through manufacturers directly. And I really can't explain why that is the case, because it obviously would save you and Medicare money. Uh, it may be that the pharmaceutical industry doesn't allow it, but it's also the anti-kickback laws are congressional. So there's something in Congress um, that has that has kept uh, people with Medicare from getting drugs directly from their manufacturers. Um, but if you have Part D, uh, which is the Medicare prescription drug benefit, you should be able to get all the drugs you need 
um, at a relatively low out-of-pocket cost. That is not always the case, though, and I want to hammer that home because sometimes it could be cheaper to get your drugs through a Costco mail order program or through a Mark Cuban mail order program or through some other program uh, in the U.S. Uh, and you could save a ton of money. Um, one Medicare patient emailed me last week explaining that he, his wife gets two of her drugs through her Part D plan and two of her drugs through Costco mail order. And just for example, one of those drugs costs $700 for the copay alone for the year in Medicare Part D, but it costs $56 for the whole drug for the year through Costco online. So unfortunately, the way the Medicare Part D drug benefit has been set up, you really have to do a lot of homework, not only to see whether your Part D plan will give you the best possible coverage, and there are many you can choose from, um, but also, you should also be checking to see if there's an alternative way of getting your drugs in this country through mail order that could save you even more money. And just to add to that, um, there are um, websites that you can go to that have um, verified pharmacies on them from around the world. Um, there's one called PharmacyChecker.com, for example. And some people, I think millions of people actually every year um, order their drugs from around the world to save money. And I want to add that is not legal. But when it's done for personal use, um, nobody has ever been prosecuted for doing so. And so if that's what you need to do to be able to afford your drugs, you can look into that as well. And I would recommend it. Um, but obviously, first looking at your options in this country. And uh, those resources, you should be able to go to act.tv slash care talk, our care talk website. And I think some of those uh, links are on there too. And our next question is from Barb, who asks, what is the Social Security Medicare Flex Card for seniors? Diane? So that is just an interesting question. I believe um, thrown at us through some marketer for the insurance industry, because when I went to her website to check her out, there was nothing there. Um, or her Facebook page. Uh, but let me just say that there are so many scams out there uh, trying to get people with Medicare to wire money, to give away their Medicare number or their social security information, um, their social security number, uh, whatever it is. And you need to really, unfortunately, not trust any of the marketing, really none of it. Uh, Obviously, some of it is legitimate, but you have to check out um, and really be sure that what you're hearing is for real. And let me just give you one example, which is real, but also very misleading, which is a lot of people are hearing about vision benefits and dental benefits in Medicare Advantage plans. I think it's as far as I understand, you know, it's in the TV ads and all over the place. And yes, they do sometimes offer vision or hearing benefits, but we really don't understand who gets them, how much they pay out of pocket for them, um, and where people are able to get these benefits. In fact, the Government Accountability Office just issued a report really blasting um, the current system because the government really has no handle on who's getting additional benefits, whether they're getting additional benefits, what's happening to the money that the Medicare Advantage plans say that they're spending on additional benefits. Is it going to shareholders or is it going into patient care? And so there's just so many unknowns that unfortunately the responsibility is on all of us to just do a lot of research and make sure that we're getting what we think we're getting um, whenever something is being marketed that we're interested in, because often it can be extremely misleading and maybe a lot of hokum. 
Thank you, Diane. And now I'm pleased to introduce our special guest for today, Patricia Kelmar, the Senior Director of the Healthcare Campaigns for PERG and PERG Education Fund, uh, to talk about surprise medical billing and ambulance surprise bills. So the first question for you, Patricia, is what's a surprise medical bill and how does it differ from surprising medical bills? Exactly. I think when people open up their mail from a, a medical provider, it's often surprising. Um, but there is a term of art called surprise medical bills. And that is referring to the balance bill that a patient will get after their insurance has already paid its portion and there's a remainder left that now the patient is responsible for because the bill is coming from an out-of-network provider, either a hospital or a doctor who is um, not in that patient's insurance network. So what kinds of protections do people have under this new law that was just passed a year or so ago, uh, the No Surprises Act? Uh, what kind of protections uh, are included? Yeah, well, so there's great news um, because these surprise bills, these out-of-network bills that people were getting with no, um, through no fault of their own, right? We often will go to our in-network hospital and we would um, get the treatment and care that we needed using our in-network doctor. But then afterwards, we would get these very expensive bills, finding out that our anesthesiologist was not in our network or we were brought to um, the emergency room at our own in-network emergency room and find out that the emergency room physician at our in-network hospital was not part of our insurance network. And those balance bills that we were getting could be very expensive, hundreds and even thousands of dollars. And it was happening to about one in five patients who needed hospital care or emergency room care. And so luckily, after much um, advocating on both the state level and the federal level, we were able to get some great new protections. So for a year now, patients have been protected from many of the most common surprise medical bills. Um, it's called the No Surprises Act, and it's a really important phrase to remember because if you get a bill from an out-of-network provider, you want to make sure that you know your protections under the No Surprises Act. So the first thing to know is out-of-network providers cannot send you a balanced bill for their services for anything. You only will have to pay your regular co-pays and your co-insurance. You can't get a balanced bill if you've received emergency treatment, right? So if you've gone into an emergency room, e even in your out-of-network emergency rooms, you will be protected. You can't be balanced billed for additional amounts beyond your normal copay and co-insurance. You're also protected in those cases where we did the right thing. We went to our own in-network hospital and we chose our major in-network doctor. You can't be balanced billed for those other doctors or other services at that in-network hospital for any kind of out-of-network care. And then the third important protection is any kind of care from an air ambulance, the helicopters or airplanes that might transport you for emergency reasons. Um, those entities cannot balance bill you for out-of-network treatment. So these are pretty significant um, protections, um, means you do not have to pay those extra bills. And we have found in the last um, year, about 12 million surprise bills have been avoided because of these new protections. Absolutely. And I was dealing with the $100,000 emergency bill that I had to fight because uh, they, the insurance company refused to pay it. And I did eventually get through that process. But it's so great that people won't have to deal with that, uh, that process when, when they're facing a medical emergency. Exactly. I mean, just banning the bills, they, know, they don't even get the bills. That's the key protection, right? So you're not having to figure out, is this a bill I have to pay or is this a bill I, I don't have to pay? But it is really important because it's a new law that people understand and know their rights and should really, you know, scrutinize every bill that they get that comes in. If it's an out-of-network provider, you want to get on, you know, the internet and look up um, your no surprises rights so that you understand exactly whether or not you need to be able to you are responsible for paying that out-of-network bill. 
And yeah. what do you do to not pay if you get one of those bills? So the first thing that I recommend, if you got an out-of-network bill that you are pretty clear, you know, is not um, is not allowed under the current law, the first thing I would do is contact the whoever's sending the bill, whether it's the doctor or the hospital, and let them know that you believe it's an illegal uh, surprise bill uh, that they are out of network and that you did not consent to that care or that uh, to that bill, um, and so then you would. That would be the first step, right? Um, you could also notify your insurance company because they're also interested in making sure that they're not getting billed also for an out-of-network bill. So you're kind of on the same page on that one. Uh, and then there is an 800 number that you can call to get more information um, for CMS. And I'm sure we'll be able to provide that, but I can just say it right now if you wanna grab a pen and paper, it's one 800 985 3059. And that's the hotline that's run by our federal government, CMS, the Centers for Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid Services. They're the ones who are running the hotline that are helping people understand and know their rights and handling complaints as well. And you can also go to cms.gov slash no surprises to read more about the No Surprises Act. And I think that there's some online resources there as well. Exactly. So What's missing from uh, the No Surprises Act? What are, what are the pieces that aren't covered and you could still face a surprise bill? So I think there's a few areas that we really want to think about and you want to be aware of. So the first one is this is mostly about hospital care. So if you're going into your regular provider's office, um, oftentimes we're now seeing providers are saying, you know, for your convenience, you can have your blood drawn down the hall at door number seven or you can get your you know, MRI done right here in our building uh, on the second floor. The most important thing to remember is that may or may not be part of your in-network doctor's like services, right? So you would wanna make sure anytime you're getting referred from your physician's office to this other door where they can draw your blood, that that uh, blood being drawn is being drawn by an in-network lab. Uh, that the MRI is being done by in-network services. So always just double check to make sure that um, it's part of your insurance network. Now, many people will ask the question, do you take my insurance? And almost everyone will take your insurance. It doesn't mean the same as if you were to ask, are you part of my insurance network? So I recommend everybody write down that phrase. Are you part of my insurance network? That's the real question. If they aren't, you're going to be subject to an out-of-network bill for these kinds of in-office procedures, non-hospital related procedures. So that's a one big flag. And then the second flag that I would note is that um, I mentioned that you have protections for air ambulances, right? The helicopters or the airplanes. But what you don't have protections from are ground ambulances, the ambulances that most of us would use in an emergency situation. So uh, how common are those uh, big out of network uh, ambulance bills? So it is a very common experience for people who need emergency transportation. About 3 million insured people in the U.S. take an ambulance for emergency treatment uh, to an emergency room every year. And there's about 50% chance that the ambulance that's transporting you is not part of your insurance network. And that one out of two chance um, can rise tremendously in certain areas of the country. There are other parts, there are some parts of the country where it's a two out of three chance that you'll get an out of network ambulance. And what that means is the ambulance will bill your insurance company. Anything that the insurance company doesn't pay will be sent to you. And so you could be on the hook um, for hundreds or thousands of dollars. The average uh, amount, the median amount of a ground ambulance bill right now that patients are facing is about $450. But again, it depends on the region and the area of the country that you live in. There are some states where the median amount is $1,000. So these can be very pricey bills that are not being covered by insurance that you are paying out of pocket. 
and, you know, on top of any other emergency costs that you're facing and just, you know, the health challenges that you have, it can be really daunting to have that kind of a bill come in after an emergency. So why is there this big loophole? Why were, you know, why were air ambulances included and ground ambulances with wheels left out? I think it's a bit of a complicated issue, but um, one thing is the states could not address the air ambulances because air ambulances are controlled entirely by federal law because they're under the Department of Transportation and states cannot control air transportation. So Congress knew the only way to solve this was a federal solution. Um, we have 10 states in the country right now that have been uh, working to protect patients from ambulances on the ground. And those states are doing a lot for the people who are insured under a state regulated plan. But about 60% of insured people in the US end up um, having their insurance through their employer. And most of those plans are not subject to state law. So we really need a federal solution. I think the other challenge is that ambulances across the country are provided in a variety of different ways. And there are different types of business models for ambulance services, emergency transportation services. Sometimes communities will contract with one ambulance company to provide all the ambulance services in a community. Sometimes hospitals themselves offer ambulance services, so they're operated as part of the hospital. And other times communities are served by private ambulance services. Um, so the dispatcher just sends you whoever's available um, and next on the list. So it's like, you know, roulette, Russian roulette, you know, what are you gonna get? We're not really sure. Um, and in an emergency situation, you're certainly not in a condition to, you know, call your insurance plan, find out who's in network and then call that particular ambulance company. No, you're just calling 911. Absolutely. And so what can people do to protect themselves from big uh, ambulance bills? Well, there's not much that they can do to protect themselves individually from um, ambulance bills. The, the most important thing, I think, would be to ask for a uh, itemized bill, understand and make sure that it's correct, work with your insurance plan and your ambulance company to see if you can negotiate down the price. Um, and if you do have to end up paying it, make sure you don't just put it on your credit card, ask for a payment plan. Um, first of all, you want to maintain that amount that you owe as medical debt, because there's certain types of protections for some types of medical debt. Once you put it on your credit card, it becomes credit card debt, and then it's treated differently by collectors and um, on your credit reports. So keep it as a... Um, as a medical debt by working out a payment plan, which usually is at a lower interest rate anyway with the ambulance company. So that's what I would say like in a personal situation, but we really have need to push our legislators both on the state level and the federal level to make sure we get a solution to this. It's crazy to think that we're paying a lot of money for our insurance. We are doing the right thing by getting emergency care when we need it so that we don't get any sicker. And we should be able to rest assured that our insurance plan will cover that and that we won't be hit with a very expensive bill. Ambulance services are needed, obviously, in every community, but paying for them on the backs of the few unlikely you know, dozens of people in your community and having them bear the burden and the financial burden of all of that cost is really not the way that um, we Americans pride ourselves, right? We're communities and we want to make sure that people have good health care and that we're all paying a little bit so that no one is, is um, facing a really expensive charge through no fault of their own. And so what can we as Americans do, uh, since this is something that Congress needs to solve? Should we be contracting our congressperson and ask them to do something about it? Absolutely. So I would target your local um, member, right? Your Congress, uh, Congress member and then your two senators. Let them know about surprise billing protections and how well they're working, but how there's a big gap 
we still need to cover ambulances on the ground um, and that they're common and that you want the security to know that you can call 911 and you won't be bankrupting your family. There is a federal advisory committee that was set up under the No Surprises Act to address the issue. Uh, it is going to start meeting in March and it has 180 days to make recommendations to Congress. And then we hope Congress will immediately take up the mantle and solve this problem. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Patricia. Uh, thank you everybody for watching. Please keep calling and texting in your healthcare and health insurance questions and we'll answer them in future shows. And this is Care Talk.